All right, what is up, gang? Another episode of Tuesday Morning Coffee. I'm with Tony Too Tall Woodall. Oh, Too Tall. You know, I'm sure you've been called that before. Once or twice. That's good. That's, That's good. Second grade, probably. <laughs> is that when you started to get taller than everybody? <laughs> well, I was pretty average until, um, like, when I finished the 10th grade, I was six foot. And so, which, you know, on a basketball team is pretty normal. Yeah. But when I came back in the 11th grade, I was six six. Wow. And I could barely walk. I mean, I was just like a, a plasma, you know, just kind of. All right. You got to you got to talk about the car now. Oh, yeah. Well, my dad got us a little Volkswagen because you had a brother, uh, my brother. And he was he was about the same height I was. But at that time, but he was also big. I mean, he was a football player and I weighed probably one. Sixty five and he wow. weighed like. 235 is like somebody strapped an eighth grader on the back of him. You know, it was just that big, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so then, so it was hard to, it was hard for us to fit in that little Volkswagen. Like a beetle, like a beetle. Okay. Yes. All right. It's hard to understand. fit in there. So he, he, uh, he made the front seat driver's seat to where you could take it out. And then you could just drive from the back seat then, which was just normal, you know. So you'd pull up at a red light next to somebody, and you'd look over at them and wave, but you're waving from the back seat, <laughs> the back window. <laughs> he didn't like it when we did that, but we liked it when we'd have little ice storms because we'd find big church parking lots. And yeah. You'd just you'd drive that thing to where it was going about 40. You'd put it in neutral and throw that emergency brake on. That oh, thing yeah. just go shoo, shoo, shoo. I bet. And and looking at uh, looking at the car from the side, all you saw was nobody, <laughs> nobody in the nobody. Front. So th that's really good. That's really good. So uh, yesterday I wasn't here at the office. Right. So uh, we had a, a big birthday celebration. For Another father son Mason. thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, which was a lot of fun. We uh, my son turned four and uh, he's been obsessed with the Polar Express since he saw it. Oh, wow. The movie. Okay. And so I think the last three birthday parties have been Polar Express themes, but it's in June. And so last year we had a, oh. like a train go through the neighborhood and we had uh, everybody over our house. And to, this time we, we went to the Discovery Center, like okay. a little science museum sort of right. thing. And, right. Uh, we had a big cake and then uh, the ice truck came, cone ice. So there is a small town. Uh, on the Cumberland Plateau, just across the Kentucky line in Kentucky. And it may be Stearns, Kentucky. I'm going to find out where it is. They have a train there. <clears throat> and twice a year, they do train themes. And you can go ride the train. Mm. And I forget what it is. It may be Cowboys. No, it's not Cowboys and Indians. It's, it's something in the summertime. You go ride the train. It's that theme. But in the wintertime at Christmas, they do the Polar Express. The whole deal. Wow. So you guys are going to have to we'll have find to out where that. that is, and y'all have to go do that. We'll have to do that. Yesterday, we went to, to ride a train in Chattanooga, and so had a big time with that. It was an old 1920 steam engine. Uh -huh. And uh, it's amazing to me that today, you can't get toys that uh, that don't break in three months. But back then, you could have a train built. So was that the little old. Chattanooga choo-choo that's... No, I don't think it was that, but it, it was uh, up in East Brainerd. Okay. So that is in the neighborhood of the house that we bought that had all the liens on it. I uh, can't think of the name of the little street right now. Ladder. It's on Ladder. Ladder. Yeah. Ladder is probably a quarter of a mile from that train. Hmm. Did not know that. As a matter of fact, it runs up behind Ladder. Uh, it runs on the side of a hill up behind where Ladder dead ends right there. Interesting. Interesting. Well, you know, my wife said, do we have anything that we own over here? And I said, well, I don't know, but I'm sure we've done deals around here. <laughs> so yeah, that, that was kind of fun. And so I got home and I'm doing triathlon training right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the very, very beginnings of it because I can't swim and I can't bike or run very far, but uh, I'm basically running five K's right now. And I said, Hey, you know, it's uh, we have a heat advisory. Uh, the feels like is 105 to 110. So it's going to be a great idea for me to, to test my manhood and go run right now. Yeah. You know, let's go run. It didn't work out very well. Yeah, I was going to say. So about minute 26, <laughs> I was just gassed out. And I never <laughs> stopped running. I couldn't go anymore. So, so if it hadn't have been, let's say we'd have had 82 and no humidity, what what would have been your time you'd have probably finished that? Year? I mean, I'm not fast. I mean, I'm a terrible runner. But, I mean, if I wanted to, probably in the 28-minute range, something like okay. that. You know, um, 
but yeah, at yesterday it was never. <laughs> so you didn't have that far to go. No, I didn't. Okay. I didn't, you know, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was not my best moment, but, uh, looking back. So I, at the very beginning, I was pretty disappointed in myself, frankly. I was like, you know, I should have done this. I should have paced myself better. I should have maybe not gone out in the heat, that kind of thing. But uh, after I took a, a cold bath and I was like, you know what? I was the only person out there that was even trying. Yeah. Like I almost always in my neighborhood see people out there. I was the only one even trying. And so at the end of the day, I felt really happy that I'd done it. Even though it's like I quote unquote failed at what I was attempting to do, I still got farther ahead than everybody on the couch. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I felt okay about that. That was yeah. okay. So uh, that was kind of yesterday for me. A uh, couple of, of items here. We are having a free support call uh, for anyone that is not a part of the apprenticeship. Of course, the apprenticeship members uh, are welcome, but we're just going to be having a free support call. So if you're on the email list, you're going to get an email yet tomorrow uh, with the link for that. It'll be on Zoom. And uh, just to kind of give back to the community and answer questions and see if we can help. Okay, so be looking like out it. for that. Uh, that's at 5 p.m. Central Time on Thursday. So mark your calendars for that. If you want to be a part of that, you're not on the email list, you can join that by just emailing us, support at bradsmotherman.com, and we'll make sure that you are a part of that. Um, and I guess the last housekeeping item for today, we have the Stinky House Challenge coming up Ooh, here in about an hour. Stinky House Challenge. Stinky House Challenge. Now, you've been to this house. Yes, I have. Is it stinky? It's stinky. Okay, it's that's a, good. It's a challenge. Okay, I, um, perfect. You know, the front door that the guy unlocked, on the video and said, Oh no, I'm not going in. Yeah. There. Locksmith wouldn't change the lock. He would not just cause he was going to have to get, I mean, he could have opened the door and changed it from outside the house, right? but he would not even go in. Yeah. But the side door was unlocked. So I went through the side door and which is like the laundry room and into the kitchen, you know, and I didn't get past the laundry room. Ooh. I'm excited. When I stepped on the stuff that was in the floor in the laundry room. So these people, it's, they're not, ho they weren't hoarders. Um, they just, okay. They might've been, they might've had a little, they might've just been not full hoarders, but like that. It's just a tiny bit of hoarder in them. And so they, and you get to the back rooms, there's a bunch of stuff back there, but in that laundry room, there was like dog food and different things been left there. And it wasn't like it was dog food from last week. I mean, this house been sitting still for, a long time with the windows closed and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I reached, I, I stepped in, I was going to go in and I stepped on the pack of dog food, big bag of dog food that was laying there and two, two mice ran out from under it. And it does not matter how many Disney movies you watch and the mouse, the, the mices, the mice are cute. It's kind of sweet. You. It's not sweet when they run out from under your foot. <laughs> you, you jump, you, you say non-Baptist words which is not good. And well, they, the Baptists will say something. They'll, every, they'll say some, you know, it's, they, yeah, they were non-church Christ words. So <laughs> anyway. All right. So we got that. If you're not on TikTok, oh, uh, stinky. Be, be sure and, and catch us there. I think we're going to do, uh, if you can stay in there for an hour, then you, get, you make 250 bucks. In this heat, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Well, I'm not trying to pay it. So that's yeah. okay. That works right. out well. You win 250. Yeah. A lot of people aren't making two hundred and fifty dollars an hour to just stand their time. That's true. So we'll we'll see if we get anybody that wins. I mean, it's going to take you a week to get the stank off of you. Well, I, that's not my issue. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have fun with it. Um, all right, guys. A couple of things I want to talk about today. I, I'm thinking we might get to why we don't do lease options. Um, basically, most of what we do is owner finance. We will do lease options in the short circumstance that um, we have a deal that's going to be owner finance, but somebody's waiting on a, a down payment. So maybe they have an inheritance coming or they're waiting on 401k money or, or whatever that is. In that kind of a, a circumstance, we will do a short-term lease option, maybe 30 days, maybe 90 days, something like that, so that they can get their funds. But uh, by and large, we do not do lease options. We'll, we'll I hope, be talking about that, but we'll see. Okay. okay. Um, everything's good, Lucas. Yeah, that's all right. Was it, it wasn't full of anything, was it? Just a little bit? Okay, cool. We're good. We're good. Um, what I want to talk about first is the real estate market, because a lot of the questions that I'm getting are centered around, are we crashing? What's going on? They're watching the stock market, which is now in a bear market. They're looking at Bitcoin, which has gone from, I don't know, like 60K down to 23 or 25, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, they're with Bitcoin. 
uh, one of the largest owners of Bitcoin. It's a publicly traded company. Uh, if Bitcoin hits 21, then they have a margin call, which means that they have to sell off assets to cover their margin because they borrowed uh, to buy more Bitcoin on margin. And so that would further drive the price down. But you're looking at asset classes that are not doing very well. Mm -hmm. Stocks, by and large, are not doing very well. Crypto, all my real estate friends that were also uh, short-term crypto experts, um, I would see this all the time when Dogecoin was going up and all this stuff to the moon and you know you'd have the rocket ship you know multiple rocket ships and the you know all these emojis and everything i'm not seeing that anymore yeah <laughs> we have, we cease to see anybody talking about crypto in a positive way and like i don't have crypto frankly i don't even have stock because i don't understand it i understand stock a little bit more than crypto where it's like okay there's this coin that is created by a computer and it has value of $50,000, but you can't touch it, and it exists somewhere, you know? And um, I really like what Warren Buffett said about Bitcoin. He said this at his annual meeting, it was him and Charlie Munger, but uh, basically said, if you gave me, if you said, okay, um, you can have 1% of all the farmland in the country, and it's $20 billion, he said, I'll write you a check. I'll write you a check. Uh, if you said you can have all the Bitcoin in the world for $20 million, I would pass. And basically that it's not a store of value because it doesn't create anything. Like businesses create, um, you know, farmland creates, mm -hmm. but there's no intrinsic value in Bitcoin. And it'll be really interesting to see what happens with this. But all that to say, um, people are taking what's happening in the market and um, really extrapolating it to real estate, right? And there's just a sense of fear, it seems like, <clears throat> almost everywhere, mm -hmm. okay? And so one of the d things that we talk about here, and I've really based my life on, is we don't make decisions based on fear. Mm -hmm. We don't make decisions based on fear because nothing ever good comes out of a, a fear-based yeah. mindset. A another bad decision will come out of decisions made by fear. Talk to me about that. Well, just, I mean, when we... When we make decisions because we're afraid, we tend to continue to make fearful decisions. And we dig ourselves deeper in a hole before we can find out. Instead of making a decision where we can stand still, out in the daylight, see what's happening, uh, adjust. Interesting. Uh, when we start making decisions in fear, we're backing into a cave. Before long, we're making decisions and we can't even see anything that's going on. We're just heading deeper and deeper into that cave. So yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, that's one of the things I've always appreciated about you. We have bought some houses that we either bought right, did not process well, and didn't make any money. Might have even lost a little bit. Yeah. But we don't. We didn't quit. You don't go into a cave. You don't stop buying houses. You just continue to learn from what we did. Yeah. Do it better. Keep going. So. Yeah, I mean, not every deal is a grand slam, no. or does it need to be? So, um, but I would say up until about three years ago, we we had lost on on maybe less than five houses. Mm. You know, so we had a, a, an exceptional batting average. Yeah. But one of the things that I realized is if if I'm making money on every single house, then I'm not being aggressive enough. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, now I wouldn't tell like a normal new person to have that right. uh, that type of mindset, but for us it would be okay. You know, like we can handle a loss every once in a while yeah. and it's not that big of a deal. But I mean, we've had a lot of change. We've had a lot of change. So uh, 30 year rates have basically gone from three and a half percent to five and a half percent. They're going to be approaching six, it seems very, very soon. Mm -hmm. And this is in a span of like 120 days. Mm -hmm. I've never seen rates go up this fast. Uh, the 15 year rate is now at 4.7% and we're now seeing for the first time and probably, gosh, maybe close to 15 years, uh, adjustable rate mortgages. So the idea of uh, the banks want to hedge the risk of inflation, uh, which is now in the eight and a half percent range. That's the government st statistic that people don't really uh, adhere to or at, at least acknowledge because you go to the grocery store, you go to the gas pump, you go to the car lot, you go to these places, you know that uh, year over year things have gone up more than eight and a half percent. But uh, that's the figure. Um, but with adjustable rate mortgage, you have maybe a five on a five one arm. Basically what that means is that it's five years 
fixed, and then after that, it adjusts based on the rates. And it, you know, it could adjust down, it could adjust up, but it shifts the risk from the bank of holding 30-year paper at a fixed rate to the borrower. And so mm -hmm. we're seeing that happen for the first time at 3.7% on a 5-1 arm. So are they basically, are they basically asking, so if I, if I go get a mortgage, they're asking me to take some of the risk with them? Yeah, on the arm, that's correct. Okay. On the arm, that's correct. And so it hasn't made sense at all. And I, I would argue probably it still doesn't make sense that if you can qualify, even at five and a half percent, six percent, that's not an expensive rate. No, no, it's no, not no. an expensive rate. That's a short term view that looks at this as an expensive rate just because we were just at 2.95 or 3.1. You know? Right. Right. I mean, it's a matter of perspective and it's a very short perspective view. Right. That's right. So. But we're seeing that for the first time. A new poll just came out. 80% of buyers believe it's a bad time to buy. 80%. 80%. And I believe that was a Gallup poll. I'm not 100% sure on that. 80% uh, of buyers think it's a bad time to buy. And I mean, look, it's easy to sensationalize what's going on. It's easy. Because fear sells. Mm -hmm. It captures people. It captures attention. And so if you're in the media, it's really easy to say, oh, Things are different. Okay. And on my Facebook feed, it's really interesting because most of my friends seem to uh, almost gloat about, oh, crash is coming, crash is here, that kind of sensationalism. And not all of them, not all of them, but a vast majority of them are people that are very new to the game. Okay. So they don't really have context of, of what could possibly be happening anyway. Mm -hmm. And is there a, a, a chance that we do? Uh, have a major correction in real estate? Certainly. If rates go to 10%, I don't know what value is. You know, but there's no indication that that's going to happen. Uh, now, the, people will buy houses at 10%. 100%. People will buy houses. And the game will change. It doesn't mean that there's no game. It's just the rules of the game change. Yeah. Now, um, it's so funny because there are so many people that have been waiting for this buying opportunity. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm waiting for the crash. I'm going to wait for the crash because they didn't know how to buy. They didn't know how yeah. to market and buy. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what happens. The The sloppy buying is over with now. You're going to have to, if values on the back end are not going to bail your butt out. Oh, man. Then yeah. you're going to have to learn to buy because we've been buying sloppy because we could. Right. And now all of a sudden that tightens up and we're, we're like, well, you can't make any money in this market. No, you, you need to learn how to buy. Right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of very, very stupid decisions have been covered up by a very, very quickly appreciating market. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I've seen people that I knew on the front end that that's a stupid move, but the market saved them. Mm -hmm. Like pretty much anything that you bought 36 months ago, and you even if you overpaid by 5 or 10%, right. you've held it during that time because you couldn't sell it. You, you got saved mm -hmm. during this market. And so it's been easy to not be fundamental, to not base decisions on conservatism. And I'm not talking about political here. Yeah. I'm talking about financial conservatism, right. that um, we're not going to be overly risky, that we're, we're not going to go above 70% of value if it's cash. That's right. You know, where I've seen people be like, oh, I, I do the 80% rule. I'm like, what the hell is that? Yeah. The 80% rule, like, is, is that a beauty measurement or something? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, that doesn't even quantified to me as being a real estate and the 70 is just cash correct yeah i mean we we might and usually we're not doing that yeah so mm. uh mortgage rates have have increased a lot uh mortgage-backed securities this is a big big deal uh, i believe it was last week uh mortgage-backed securities got zero bids okay so basically and i'm going to explain this at a very elementary level thank you because that's all i can do uh i would love to have bill ford in Oh, yeah. Maybe we can do that. Uh -huh. But I'd love to have Bill Ford in. He's a university professor, but uh, former uh, Federal Reserve chairman in, I believe, Atlanta. Uh, he was one of my um, uh, economics professors back in undergrad. And uh, he would not write on the board. He had an assistant write on the board for him. So his assistant would come in, get the projector up, all of this. And then uh, Dr. Ford would walk in and, and he would say, well, write this or write that, that kind of thing. Uh, only time I've seen that, uh, in my, my, my college, uh, college days, but, uh, we, we need to, to reach out and see if we can have them on. But, um, 
So basically what happens is the bank will write 10,000 loans. Let's say it's uh, a, a fairly regional bank, say SunTrust. Okay. SunTrust writes 10,000 mortgages and then they package them up as one asset and then they sell them off to the secondary market to create liquidity within the bank so that they can continue to write mortgages. And so basically they're in the fee business. They're not in the interest business, they're in the fee business. So they're, they're charging a loan origination fee, they're doing um, you know, a underwriting fee and doc prep and all this other stuff that they're making money on. And then they sell the loan off, usually at par value. So basically if there's a $100,000 loan created day one, they're selling it off for 100, so they're just getting their money back and um, they are making their fees. So they had this auction last week where all these mortgages are getting sold. Zero bids. Mm. Zero bids. And so you look at it from an inflationary perspective. You know, if you're buying mortgages that are have a four and a half percent interest rate and the inflation rate's closer to nine, then you have a negative return on that money. And I've said this about like treasury bonds for such a long time. It's like, why would you take a 10 year bond at 1% whenever back then the um, inflation rate was three? And it stated that the Fed wants a 3% rate. So it just doesn't make any sense. The Fed is meeting on Wednesday. The market has seemingly priced in a 0.75% bump in the Fed funds rate. So that's the rate in which uh, banks borrow from the Fed. And so that usually, it's not a one-for-one -one correlation, but that, that's usually correlated with a, a mortgage rate increase, which means that we're looking at probably a 6% interest rate on the 30-year uh, here pretty quickly, here pretty quickly. And so you, you think about it from a, a buyer perspective, it's a little bit of a whiplash sort of situation because there are a lot of people that got qualified for a loan back six months ago at three and a half, and now they're looking at six, maybe six and a quarter here very, very soon. Um, we've had transactions where we get down to closing and because the rates reset when they first started, um, it knocked the buyer out of being able to qualify. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of the situation that we're in uh, to the negative. <clears throat> That's the situation to the negative. Mm. To the positive, uh, a new inventory report came out. Um, there's two months of inventory in the top 100 mar markets in the country. Just two months of inventory. So we still have a really, really low, low inventory market. And even though rates are increasing um, and there is some instability in the mortgage market, it seems, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're seeing any of it. So I was telling Tony uh, right off camera a few minutes ago, we had three pinned last week, all retail deals, and I've got the numbers on them. Uh, Edmondson, we paid, I believe, $75,000 for. We just pinned it at one ninety nine. dollars That was maybe two, three, four days on market. Uh, Cumberland City, we bought for ninety seven dollars and pinned it at one eighty. dollars um, That was, we got the offer the next day mm -hmm. from listing mm -hmm. uh, with bad pictures. And um, Forest Morristown, we bought for 140,000 and sold at 329 cash. So even within this market where people are saying is completely destabilized and is crashing, right. right. In the starter home market, we're not seeing this issue. Mm -hmm. And we we had a conversation with the uh, the buyer's agent on um, on Edmondson. So again, we bought it for 75, sold at 199 that um, that they had been beaten out of so many houses. Like if we could just accept their offer, they would be so happy and they're, <laughs> and they're not going to ask for repairs right. and all, you know, the whole thing. So we still have a lot of buyers that over the past year, year and a half have been so beat down mm -hmm. from the market that we've been in that they're still anxious to buy and very happy. Yeah. To buy. Yeah. Cause they want to own a house. Yeah. Do you think that, home ownership will ever lose its value outside of some crazy technological advancement or anything like that. Do you, do you feel like the average person still wants to own? Because crazy, it seems crazy development like crypto. No crazy development. Like, <laughs> I mean, there, there's an idea. That's what I'm saying though. I don't, I don't like, think it will hope, uh, like, lose its value. Like the matrix, you know? So, yeah. so I, I read a lot of news. Uh, Google just had um, one of their head AI developers, say that they've created a sentient being that the conversation that they're having with this AI is, um, is to the point that it has evolved to have emotion. So outside of something like that, <laughs> which I don't even, I, I can't quantify that. Uh, 
do you think that the average person is going to say, you know what, I'd rather rent, somebody else can own it, and that way I don't have to deal with repair? Or is the idea of, you know, homeownership being an asset and being a fundamental principle of, of community, is that ever going to go away? Because you've seen a lot more social changes than I have. No, I mean, I mean, the worst things that happen, um, large wars, um, a total depression. I mean, home ownership is not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, now, how we how we go through that process is probably going to see some changes. I, th I personally think we're going to see a lot of uh, non-institutional type lending like owner financing that will start to increase because people have to find creative ways to do things. Yeah. Um, I mean, we just think about it. There was a time when we thought that owner financing a home to someone at 7% interest was high. Yeah. 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 Guys, that, that's a big, big value add to what we do because we buy a lot subject to, and those rates were taken over right now. I just approved one right before this, this call where we approved a deal. It's at a 3.25% rate. I'll have $15,000 cash in it, which I'll get back from my buyer's down payment. And now that 7.9 that we have been charging for a long time is looking cheap yeah. to these people. Because if they go to qualify and the, the, the mortgage banker says, well, the rate you might be able to get is six, six and a quarter, but you can't get that because you don't qualify because you had uh, a health issue three years ago. Right. Or you had a divorce three years ago. Or you changed a job in the last six months. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're bad people, um, but you can't qualify. And now we're at 7.9. We're literally making more in interest than the bank is without having to lend the money. That's pretty tough to mess up. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things, and I'm, I'm glad you talked about this. It wasn't on my agenda. The, the idea of equity changes because the idea of equity is not just price equity anymore. It's term equity. Mm -hmm. So if we're taking over a 3% loan, what's the value of that loan being fixed at 3% when we're not even on the mortgage? Mm -hmm. It's a huge, mm -hmm. huge difference. It's huge. I mean, the last, the last four that I've done have all been by subject to owner, owner finance. And I'm going to stay on that focus. I'm going to make the, the fix and flips have to surprise me. Yeah, correct. Because the better money, is on buying with creative financing Absolutely. and owner finance. Absolutely. You, you can capture as much, if not more equity in your note than you would capture cash if you did a fix and flip and got it all at one time. Yeah, a hundred percent. And the thing is guys, it's not the cash pops that retire you. It's cash flow. Yeah. And what will always create wealth. I don't care if you're in the great depression, the great recession or in the dot com boom or whatever is you have assets of cash flow. If you have assets at cash flow, it's really, really tough to mess up, you know, and I believe in real assets, you know, real estate, you can see it, you can touch it. There's multiple exit strategies. It's easily financeable. It's highly divisible and that the market is highly div uh, divisible. You don't have three or four companies that control the market. Mm -hmm. You know, you're always going to have people that run into a house problem because of life circumstance. So the market never goes away. Mm -hmm. And actually what we do gets better yeah. during these times. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm going to say this, strictly financially speaking, strictly financially speaking, I'm really excited about what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Really excited about what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Because you have all these investors, man, mm -hmm. that they don't know what a normal market is. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I posted on Facebook uh, a couple of days ago. I try not to get into Facebook fights. You know? <laughs> and I didn't. But uh, this lady, she's a realtor. And I, maybe she's been doing it in a long time. I have no idea. But she said, uh, you know, we're in the beginnings of a crash and all this stuff. And, uh, I put on there, I said, you know, if we went to a 90 to 120 day on market and in, of inventory kind of situation, everybody would say it's a crash mm -hmm. because they're used to six and not 60. Yeah. And so what we have really is a bunch of investors that don't have the context and, and they don't have the investing maturity mm -hmm. to, to know. And so all these investors are going to leave the market. These wholesalers are going to leave the market. They've been mudding the waters and we've been able to operate quite well. Mm -hmm. Like I don't care what the market's going to do, but we're, we're switching to everybody's scared. 
Yeah. Everybody's scared. Yeah. You know, recent triggers are difficult and we, we have a recent trigger. So most realtors out there right now were realtors during the last recession, no eight. Yeah. And what we saw then was everybody and their grandmother was a realtor, right? Lots of part-time realtors at the time, because there was fruit laying all over the ground. Uh, you didn't even have to, you didn't even have to know what you were doing sometime. But then when that, when it tightened up, all of the low hanging fruit folks that didn't know what they were doing or didn't want to work hard, they got out of that. And the real full-time, really good, solid realtors who knew what they were doing made good money during that. But recent triggers are tough for people. This feels a lot like that. That felt like a crash. So this feels like a crash. The same thing's happening again. And I don't think it's the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's not the same thing at all. There are fundamental differences in what we're seeing in the market. Um, but even if we did have a crash, that's not necessarily a bad thing for everyone. Look how quickly recovered after the last one. Yeah. Yeah. And and I hate it because we lost a couple of good builders here. Who oh, took their own lives. I know. And um, but it it just as quickly as it went south, it went through its process and boom, even bigger than it was before that. So I think some of this is a recent, you know, it's like a recent trigger. Yeah. And, and that makes sense. But it's really easy for people to negatively sensationalize whatever they want to because it, it brings attention. Yeah. It brings attention. So, um, you know what? I, I think we've, we've ran for about 30 minutes. Um, I think we'll call it a day on that. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the lease option stuff will take about another 30 minutes to go through. And um, I think that this really deserves its own segment because it's such an important thing, guys. Like we can't be scared of change. With every change, there's opportunity, mm -hmm. you know. Now, um, we have to learn to adapt at times. And so there are people that are going to have to learn to adapt or probably a year or two from now, they're not going to be around mm -hmm. that they're just wholesaling and now the equity is going to start to dry up in price because mm -hmm. they don't understand that term equity exists mm -hmm. or they have been sloppy with their purchasing mm -hmm. uh, and they, they, they're they not going to be able to do that anymore because they're going to start losing money That's on right. deals that they've right. broken even on or, or done okay on. Everything's going to shift with that. And um, if, but I mean, here's the last thing I'll leave you guys with is if you want advice about these kinds of scenarios, listen to people that have been through multiple market cycles because they have context where a lot of the new people, it doesn't mean they're bad. It's just, they're just green. Mm -hmm. They just don't understand uh, the context of things. Mm -hmm. You know, are there problems in the market right now? Yes. But with every problem, there's an equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. We just have to learn to adapt to the opportunity. Okay. Guys, we'll call it a day. Appreciate y'all being mm -hmm. with us. Tuesday morning coffee, Thursday night, 5 p.m. Central time. If you want to jump on the free support call, be sure and come and see me. We'll see you guys next time. Y'all take it easy.